Today in finite state morphology, we continue our examination of two-level morphology. Two LC or two-level compiler is one of the tools that is installed with the Xerox finite state morphology toolkit. The two-level morphology formalism is different from the rewrite rule formalisms used in XFST. In this lecture, we will be examining the use of the two-level formalism to create a finite state transducer for a tiny toy language. We will create a grammar file, which we will then compile and use using the 2LC compiler. Let's begin by creating this file. This is going to be just a text file, although it will be formatted according to the rules of the 2L grammar formalism. At the beginning of a 2L grammar, one must first define the alphabet. The alphabet includes individual symbols that are in the sigma of the finite state transducer, as well as the pairs that can go on the upper and lower side of an arc. If a symbol is put by itself, that implicitly means that it is an identity. So writing A by itself is equivalent to saying A colon A, meaning on this, in, this, in the transducer that we're going to eventually create, A is a member of the alphabet on the upper side of the arc and on the lower side of the arc, and that there is, there will be, there is licensed to have arcs A, A. On the other hand, if we have B colon C, that would mean that B can only go to C, unless we also have B goes to B. So to recap, if we have an alphabet in our two-level grammar, that says A, B, C. That is really shorthand for A colon A, B colon B, C colon C, which means that it is licensed by the grammar to have arcs in the transducer which have A on the upper side and A on the lower side. It is also licensed to have arcs in the transducer with B on the upper side and B on the lower side. And it is also licensed in the transducer to have an arc with C on the upper side and C on the lower side. Let's begin with a simple alphabet that allows A to go to A, B to go to B, and also allows A to go to B. A two-level grammar has a rules section. In the rules section, we will define individual rules that will each compile to their own finite state transducer. Each rule is given a human readable name inside quotes, for example, A to B.
This name is an arbitrary string that is given by the grammar writer. While this name is descriptive, one could just as easily put a completely unrelated name. Next comes the definition of the rule itself. The first thing that we're going to have in the rule is a rewrite, a transduction, a two-level transduction from A to B. A on the upper side is rewritten as B on the lower side. Then we have an arrow, which we discussed in the previous video. Documentation for this arrow and the other types of arrows is found in the two-level compiler document, which is freely available online. Next, we're going to define the context in which this rewriting happens. The underscore is going to refer to the context. So where we see underscore here is where this will occur. So let's say that we wanted to write a rule that says any time that we have B preceding A, we will rewrite A to B. If we want to say specifically that we're looking for B on the lower context, then we would write it like this. If we specifically wanted to say B on the upper context, we would write it like this. And if we wanted to say B on the upper and lower contexts, it would be like this. Let's go with this. This will mean that if we have an input string of the form A, that'll get rewritten as A. If we have a string AB, that'll get rewritten as AB. If we have ABA, because we have B in the lower context, this will match this rule, and this A will get rewritten as a B. We then have another A. Because its preceding context has B on the lower side, that will also get rewritten as B. If we have another A, the preceding context, the lower side, will be a B, and we'll have another A. Excuse me, another B. And so on. So let's save the file and then go to the two-level compiler. I'm going to hit Control Z to put this process in the background and then launch 2LC. We're going to begin by using the read grammar command. Read grammar followed by the text file that we just wrote, ab.text. 2LC opened the text file, read the rules, read the definition of the alphabet, the rules, and indicated that it successfully read the A to B rule. Next, we're going to compile the grammar into a finite state transducer. The A to B text file was processed, analyzed, the rule components, and then compilation of the rule. At this point, 
we could test the machine within 2LC. As expected, if we apply down on the string A, the result is A. If we apply down on the string B, the result is B. If we apply down on the string AB, the result is AB. ABB gets ABB. ABA gets ABB, just as expected. In addition to seeing the results of apply down here, we see the individual levels, the pair, the matching pairs. This is equivalent to A colon A, B colon B, and then here we see the rewrite process for each subsequent letter. By typing question mark, the program will print out again all of the commands available to us. If we want to have this machine available for use elsewhere, for example, importing into XFST, we can use the save binary command. providing a file name where the file will be saved to. We'll call this FST. At this point, we can quit 2LC. And observe that we have our original text file in the binary ab.fst. Next, let's load XFST. Within XFST, we're going to use the load defined command in order to read in the binary that we just created using 2LC. XFST is able to successfully open the binary file. In doing so, we see that this file is defined, how many states it has, how many arcs it has, and that it is circular. Let's try pushing it. Unfortunately, the fact that we have spaces in the name gave XFST problems. Let's try one more time escaping the spaces. That worked. Recall that in XFST, the percent sign serves as the escape character. Thus, we are able to escape the space there and escape the space here. Next, let's examine the network. Here is the network. 
The network alphabet, its sigma, has two defined symbols, A and B. The question mark is used for out of vocabulary symbols. We see that there are two arcs, excuse me, two states, state zero and state one, and there are arcs from state zero to state zero with question mark, state zero to state zero on A, state zero to state one on B, state one to state zero on question mark, state one to state one on B, and state one to state one where A goes to B. In XFST, we can use the command write dot to view the graphical version of this network. We can then run apply down and we get the same result that we did when we ran apply down directly from within 2LC. Before in 2LC, when we tested, only apply down was the implicitly available command. Here we could, if we wanted to, run apply up. Here we see that by applying up on the string ABB, we could have gotten, we could have had on the upper side ABB or ABA. Let's open a new tab and continue working. Let's now create a second rule. In this rule, we're going to say that C goes to A if immediately preceding context has A on the upper side. Now here we have a choice. If we add C goes to A here, and only C goes to A, then this rule is essentially redundant because C is, will be only allowed to ever be A. If we want C to sometimes go to itself, we should also add C goes to C. After saving the file, let's load up 2LC. and read the grammar. We see that we have two rules, A to B and C to A. We will compile these rules. 
and again save the binary. overwriting the original binary. In XFST, let's reload the new binary. The original A to B has been redefined, and the new C to A is now also defined. Let's clear the stack and push first A to B to see what changed. Even though we did not make any changes to the first rule, the machine is different. What changed? Well, the alphabet changed. In our definition, we added the fact that C can go to C and that C can go to A. Previously, C was only available as an out-of-vocabulary symbol. The result of this machine will be exactly as intended. That A will be rewritten as B if there is an immediately preceding B on the lower side. Let's take a look at C to A. Here's the machine. To refresh, here's the rule. C is rewritten as A if its immediately left context has A on the upper side of the arc. At the start state, we do not, by definition, have A on the left context on the upper side. And so at this point, if C is encountered, it goes to itself. C goes to C. Recall that C, or any character lacking a colon, is implicitly read as going to itself. If we have a on the upper side, either A going to itself or A going to B. That leaves us in state 1. In state 1, we continue to stay in state 1 as long as there is an A on the upper side. We can go back to state 0 if we have a C that goes to A. That is licensed because by definition, since we were in state 1, an A had occurred on the immediately preceding upper arc. If we have B or an out-of-vocabulary symbol, that also results in being back in state 0, meaning C would go only to itself. At this point, we're going to try applying down on the C to A machine. C goes to C. C B goes to C B. C 
CBA could go to CBA or CBB. A could go to A or B. But if we have AC, then the C will be rewritten as, as an A, regardless of whether the A was rewritten as an A or as a B. What's going on? Why do we have two values here? Well, let's look at the machine again. Notice that we have, on this arc, A could go to A, or A could go to B. Why is that the case? Well, that is the case because our alphabet says that it is the case. So all of these rewrites are implicitly in scope in any rule. So it's as if we have a machine that will always allow A to go to A, always allow A to go to B, always allow B to go to B, always allow C to go to A, and always allow C to go to C. That's the starting point for every rule. Let me reiterate that because that's very important when it comes to understanding and internalizing what's going on in two-level morphology rules. The starting point is that we have an alphabet that defines not only the individual symbols that are allowed on the upper side and lower side, but also which pairs are allowed on arcs. The starting assumption for every rule is that all of these rewrites are allowed. The rule then restricts some of those rewrites. Specifically, this rule says that in this context, if C is on the upper side, then A is the only possibility for the lower side. So in other words, we've used this rule to prevent this arc from occurring in particular contexts. Similarly, this rule says that if we have B in the immediately preceding context, then A might only be rewritten as B. In other words, in this context, this may never occur. This is really important for understanding what's going on. And I strongly encourage you to follow along and do exactly what I've done on your own. Create a small 2L grammar, create a couple of rules, load them up, in 2LC. Let's do that again just for practice. Read grammar and then the file name. Compile the grammar. Test within 2LC if you want to, but also importantly, save the binary. and then load the binary and view the individual machines within uh, the interface of XFST so that you can visualize the machines and use them, test them individually. If we now run LexTest, we're gonna see something very interesting has happened behind the scenes.
What happened? Well, 2LC took each of our individual rules, A to B and C to A. Each of those rules was compiled into its own small finite state transducer. Those are equivalent to the ones that I showed you graphically a few minutes ago. Next, these two machines were intersected. The result is that the only output that we get when we apply down, which is what we're doing here, is that only outputs that were valid according to both machines are allowed. Each machine defined a particular restriction. Only strings which satisfy all of the defined restrictions are allowed. Thus, C goes to C. It's not allowed to go to A in this context. A goes to A, B goes to B, A goes to B, and C goes to A. This concludes our initial examination of using two-level morphology on a toy grammar.